Hello and welcome. Uh, this is going to be a class on optical methods for solid and fluid mechanics. Uh, this course will be taught by uh, two professors, uh, myself and Professor Kaushik Vishwanathan. I am Alok Kumar. I am an associate professor in the Department of Mechanical Engineering. My colleague Kaushik, uh, he is in the same department. So, um, let us see what this course is going to be all about. Okay. So, now, if I had to introduce the course, uh, I would simplistically state that this course will deal with the use of optical methods for quantification of fluid and solid mechanical phenomena. On the fluid mechanics front, the course will focus primarily on fluid flow, visualization and quantification. Uh, techniques that we will discuss uh, will include shadowgraphy, particle tracking velocimetry, particle image velocimetry. The second section of this course, which is going to be taught by my colleague, that is going to focus on the solid mechanics uh, portion and it will cover a range of uh, experimental methods, including strain field visualization like DIC, uh, which is stands for, which is short form for digital image correlation and uh, other techniques such as photoelasticity. So, uh, what you can see here is this course is going to be, so I am going to be teaching till here which is the first portion of the course. So, from here onwards to here and as you can see from some of the names uh, if you are familiar with particle image velocimetry, particle tracking velocimetry, these are uh, names of all experimental techniques. Right? So, you can get a feel of the course that this course is going to primarily focus on explaining the experimental techniques uh, used for quantification of fluid, uh, fluid flow and, uh, and then uh, uh, we are, but before even that we are also going to learn some of the uh, preliminary requirements that are needed to understand and uh, perform some of these experiments. The reference materials that are required for this course I have also pointed at out here. Uh, there, uh, so, one book uh, for example, particle image velocimetry, it is a very nice uh, book which gives you uh, uh, a nice practical guide, uh, it is also titled a practical guide, but this uh, uh, goes through a lot of details about experimental handling as well as uh, all the mathematical preliminaries that are required to understand particle image velocimetry technique and this book is written by uh, Raphael, Wilter, Verily and Kompenhans, um, it is a Springer publication. Now, these are the last names of the authors Raphael, Wilter and, uh, uh, and, and this is uh, one of the books that we are going to refer and uh, these other two books, uh, these are going to be for the second portion of the class. So, which is again as I said. Uh, will be covered by my colleague Kaushik. So, uh, these are uh, the particle image velocimetry happens to be one of the most widely used uh, 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 experimental techniques in this area and uh, hence the book that I have uh, proposed or uh, uh, as a reference material deals with just that. Uh, this we are going to use a number of different books uh, as we go along and I will try to give you as many references as I can um, uh, along the way. Okay. So, uh, this is just the beginning and uh, for every small section there might be some other book that I might uh, ask you to, uh, if you are interested in looking it up in that detail you can look up. Okay. So, this is the introduction of this course and as you can see that I focused on uh, the two words uh, in the beginning, the quantification of fluid and solid mechanics phenomena right here, right. Uh, so, this is, uh, this is, these are our operative words fluid and solid mechanics, right. So, uh, if I had to write, uh, I just uh, say, let us say, I am just going to quickly write this fluid, fluid mechanics and solid mechanics. So, what is common to the both of these? Obviously, is the word mechanics and it does not come here by any mistake. It is uh, very important uh, that these are both of these are offshoots of the overall topic of mechanics which is a very important part of mechanical engineering curricula or any uh, uh, 
uh, physical sciences curricula. So, since we have already stated that uh, the basis of both of these is in mechanics, let us uh, start uh, with the fundamental laws of mechanics that we are familiar with and which happens to be the Newton's laws of motion, right. So, now uh, with regards to Newton's laws, uh, Newton wrote, uh, gave a lot of, uh, uh, wrote down a lot, uh, his understanding and his propositions in the very famous book called the Principia. Um, it is difficult to read the Principia uh, because it is not uh, in, the, in the kind of language we are used to now. So, uh, here I am proposing a book, if you have time you can take a look at it. This book is actually written, written by Subramanian Chandrasekhar, uh, the famous Nobel laureate and he uh, goes, uh, he simplifies down Newton's Principia for the common reader, right. Uh, it is a very nicely written book and uh, it, it explains much of the details uh, of Newton's work uh, very nicely and elegantly and uh, has a lot of Subramanian's own notes on those topics. So, uh, now, uh, so basically what we want to look at is uh, what this very famous equation, right, uh, which uh, in the case of constant mass, uh, so here is assume my mass is constant. Okay. So, this is the fundamental um, topic of the one of the fundamental uh, equations that we use in mechanics. So, let us try to take a look back at what Newton had said originally for this. Okay. So, this is uh, a portion from the book, this is page 22 and uh, here uh, I am going to read out from uh, what uh, uh, Subramaniam has written here. So, this is uh, his talking about the basic concepts, uh, the laws of motion and I will just read out some of this and so he says, I am going to quote here, after the introductory lesson of fundamental notions, Newton proceeds to his second lesson to formulate the basis of his entire dynamics in the form of three laws of motion and five corollaries uh, in brackets he says which are essential parts of the laws. Again the laws and their corollaries can must be considered in their totality and not singly. Uh, this need for example was for example fully recognized by Maxwell who reformulated Newton's first laws, two laws of motion to render more precise their enunciation. Uh, in fact, Maxwell wrote a very famous book called uh, Matter and Motion if I am not mistaken and that uh, clarifies a lot of uh, things about uh, mechanics. Now, um, let us get to the important thing here which is uh, the first law which we want to read one more time. I am sure you are all very familiar with this law, it is uh, it's quite famous and something people read while they are in school, but still uh, there is something important that we need to consider. Uh, so, here for example, it says uh, every body continues in its state of rest or of uniform motion in a right line unless it is compelled to change that state by forces impressed upon it. And then uh, these are uh, uh, Subramaniam's notes be, uh, underneath it. Project, so, he says projectiles continue in their mo motion so far as they are not retarded by the resistance of the air or impelled downwards by the force of gravity, a top whose part uh, parts by their cohesion are continually drawn aside from rectilinear motions does not cease its rotation otherwise than as it is retarded by the air. The greater bodies of the planets and comets meeting with less resistance in freer space. Uh, so, it goes to the next page uh, which I have here, uh, preserves their motions both progressive and circular for much longer time. Now, uh, there is an important th uh, thing here which is this term called body that uh, Newton uses and uh, here uh, Subramaniam makes a very nice point and he says that the statement of the law is not precise uh, and he is quoting Maxwell here uh, since what are we to understand by body is not made clear. The statement as it stands is valid if a point particle or a rigid body is intended uh, as far, uh, but the content of the, okay, so, okay, we will just stop here, okay. So, the point is that this word called body here in the first law, this body means uh, a point mass, okay. So, uh, it either refers to a point mass or a, a rigid body, okay. So, if you are taking a finite body, then it is a rigid body and uh, 
the rigid body is a body which has infinite resistance to deformation and basically does not deform right. So, a rigid body does not deform. So, that is the critical portion idea here. So, uh, Newton's laws when we look back at it uh, basically is intended for uh, uh, either a point mass or a rigid body. Now, this is where, where we come in. Uh, we are actually interested in understanding real bodies, bodies that are not rigid. So, these real bodies they deform and uh, we are interested in understanding deformation. So, both in solid and fluid mechanics we encounter deformation of bodies and that is what we are interested in and uh, not just interested in uh, seeing the deformation, we are interested in quantifying it and understanding. So, uh, uh, I am just going to make this point here again, uh, we want to understand slash quantify deformation. Actually, in, in this particular course, we will not go so much in the details of understanding, but rather we will confine ourselves to the quantification of deformation because that is what we are more interested in. This course is designed uh, to be an experimental course uh, or a prime uh, introductory experimental course in understanding deformation. So, we are interested in uh, in real bodies. which deform. So, um, Newton's laws are still applicable here, but uh, for that uh, we have to, it is going to now start being valid for point masses. And then uh, if you want to understand uh, the behavior of a real body, then you have to start from uh, these point masses and build up from there uh, in order to understand deformation. So, here uh, what I am going to show you is uh, a fluid mechanical deformation. So, what we have is this, uh, this is a fluid here uh, that we will see and uh, uh, the experiment that we are showing you here, it is actually carried out in a um, cubical box like this, where there is a laser that is being shown. It is a green laser and the laser is illuminating this a laser sheet which is illuminating the box and there are tracer particles in the fluid. So, okay, these are tracer particles, tracers, I just deleted that. So, small tracer particles are, are in the fluid and uh, what is going to happen is there is this uh, top here which is going to rotate. So, this is as this rotates, uh, this there is flow that is going to happen in the system. So, So, I hope uh, you were able to see that. I will play this video one more time for you and I want you now to do something for me, which is when you look at this video, what I would like you to do is try to look at the particles which are moving. These are all tracers, these small, small, small green dots. These are looking green because there is a green laser that is coming from the side uh, and uh, these are these small things, these, uh, these are your tracer particles, right. Now, the fluid is moving. So, the entire body is deforming in this particular case and from the motion of these tracer particles, you should be able to visualize some of the flow that is happening. So, I want you to take a look at this video one more time and try to see if you can understand how the flow field looks like. So, now uh, if you were careful enough, you could have seen that the flow is moving up here. Uh, there is uh, this motion uh, that is there. I think this is the correct direction. Let me, we can re recheck if that is the current, correct direction or not. But if you see these portions, I mean you can see flow all around, but ar ar along the wall here, there is flow which is moving up. Uh, on this section, you have this uh, eddy type of situation uh, right here. Let us just see if the arrows are correct. And of course, you can now see flow at every different, po all the different points, right. Uh, okay, my arrows were in the wrong direction. This is, is, the flow is actually in this direction. Good. So, this is, uh, this gives you an idea of a deformation of a fluid system and you can already see why this course has been named 
objects as such. Uh, you are using light in this case there is a laser that is coming and uh, we are trying to understand flow behavior we are, uh, we are visualizing flow as well as we will see how this kind of an image or video actually helps us quantify the flow field also. Okay? So, this, uh, this is uh, specifically meant for this course this particular video we will use uh, P we will later uh, use uh, PIV to find uh, the flow field quantify the flow field actually. So, this is one type of deformation. Let me show you a slightly different type of deformation now. Uh, okay, this is, yeah. So, um, so now here uh, what I am going to show you in this particular video, uh, as you can see this is also a, a, a video that is taken using uh, this, it is, uh, it, it involves fluids obviously. So, there is a fluid one here and there is another fluid here. this is fluid 2, fluid 1 is lighter than the fluid two, 1, uh, sorry fluid 1 is lighter than fluid 2. So, it is up and this is the interface right. So, this is your interface and this uh, video is taken using a principle called shadow graphy, shadow graphy was used and uh, I will play this video for you and I will just quickly tell you what is happening. There is this rod here. So, this black object is the rod and it is moving at a, it is going to rotate and the angular velocity is given here is, and I will play this video for you and uh, let us see how, what happens. Okay, so, the video has now ended. So, I am going to play it again for you and I want you to uh, try and observe a couple of things. One is um, in the last video you were able to see the flow field inside, right? This time we do not have any tracer particles. So, the question is are you able to uh, understand there is obviously some sort of a flow field here uh, on the side, but can you visualize the flow field? Uh, and then you can see the deformation of this meniscus, right? So, this is the deformation of the meniscus and what happens is uh, the meniscus rises upwards and then later on it breaks. Uh, this breakage actually later on even causes the appearance of these small, uh, these droplets uh, here and it sort of becomes an immersion on the top, uh, upper liquid. So, uh, this is, this video while it is it, it does involve fluid flow and deformation is a very different video from the previous one, right? So, I will play this one more time for you. Okay, so, the video has ended again. So, you see the video, uh, the fluid 1 in the beginning was very clear, right? there is nothing, uh, there is no uh, 
dust particles or tracers or anything in there. It is very difficult to see how the fluid is actually moving, uh, although you probably have a feel that there is a fluid moving. Later on as these droplets form, uh, the upper fluid becomes a bit uh, unclean or some in some sense has, has other phases in it and their motion gives you an idea of how the fluid is actually moving. Uh, right? So, this is another type of uh, experimental technique and uh, we will talk about this also uh, when we talk about uh, experimental methods. By the way, if you want to read more about this paper uh, or this, uh, this type of uh, motion, you can refer to our paper which was published uh, in 2022 and, uh, and it discusses the physics behind this phenomenon. It is called the rod climbing effect and this is uh, for a Newtonian, two Newtonian fluids. Okay. So, this gives you some idea of, uh, uh, of, of deformation in fluids. We now uh, move on to deformation in, in solids, right. So, we have uh, solids and solids also undergo deformation. Now, what will happen is we will as you will see the deformation in fluids is rather large uh, and I use that word uh, very qualitatively here and uh, please excuse me for that, uh, but I, I know what I am, I, I will quantify that later, but uh, right now uh, just excuse me for that use, uh, light use of that word, but the flow fields uh, uh, or the flow in usually fluids is, is extremely large, whereas solids undergo deformation many a times, most regular solids the deformation is small. Okay. Again, I am as I said, uh, I am deliberately using uh, a slightly uh, qualitative word called small here uh, saying that the deformations are small. I will explain that also later, but first we want to understand deformation in solids and this is an example of a photoelastic measurement. Okay. And what you have here, there is this, uh, there is this uh, rectangular bar that you see and uh, there is a hole here in the middle of this bar and this is held uh, uh, here by clamps and these clamps are pulling it. So, this entire thing is in tension and uh, there are special glasses here. Uh, you can probably see my uh, reflection. So, this is me taking the photograph and you can see my reflection in this glass. These are special types of glass uh, which is allowing you to visualize in some sense uh, these fringe patterns that you see. Uh, right here, uh, these are uh, your uh, stress fields. Uh, these are not very quality. These are not quantitative, but uh, it doesn't tell you how much. What is the value of the stress where there is red, and what is the value of the stress where it is yellow? But it is giving you some sort of a qualitative idea that here there are stresses are different than the places. In, let's say uh, the red places uh, are are of different stress than the regions of yellow color, right? So. This is another reflection by the way in the mirror, this is uh, somebody else helping me out in the lab. This is from a picture when I took it when I was in Canada. Um, so, this is photoelastic measurement and these are all uh, small deformation problems that we will look at. So, this is this gives you an example of that. Here obviously, the deformation is so small that you will not be able to see it with your naked eye and this is obviously uh, probably gives you an idea of uh, what I meant by saying uh, small and uh, uh, large right in fluids the deformation is large enough that you can visually see it here the deformation is going to be small enough uh, for you uh, to uh, to see uh, for uh, small enough for you to not be able to see okay uh, this is a video that i'm going to play this uh, exemplifies a uh, an experimental technique called DIC, which is digital image correlation. I will quickly explain what you are going to see here. Uh, we have again a bar that you uh, in the background. Okay. This uh, bar is being pulled again in the two directions and uh, it is undergoing a tensile uh, test and it is actually going to break from somewhere here. It is going to uh, uh, fail, okay. uh, breakage slash failure will occur okay. uh, somewhere here in the middle. Uh, what you are seeing here, there is a green patch overlaid on our actual experimental image and this green patch is actually showing a strain value and this is uh, one of the principal strains. You can see green here uh, is, is zero, it stands for 0. This color bar is given on the side, so you can uh, sort of see the value. Right now, uh, everything is static, so the entire field is green, there is no 
strain value associated with this system. By the way, uh, I would like to thank uh, Praveen Kumar's lab at uh, material science uh, department at ISC Bangalore for this particular video. So, let us just go ahead and play it and see what happens. Okay. So, you can see there is some kind of a fracture pattern happening here, this is a breakage that is happening there. Are, this time uh, the strains were large enough for you to be able to see uh, unlike the photoelasticity exa example that I showed you before, you can see the things moving, but they are not moving very far away from each other in from than the original locations. And uh, these are uh, the different places are undergoing different strains, you can see the change in the values of these uh, bar graphs. So, the color values have now changed and now uh, the red is uh, 27 uh, value here. So, I will play this video again and you will see that this uh, bar graph on the uh, color graph on this uh, my right hand side that also changes in numbers. So, the numbers associated with the different colors they start changing. So, uh, I hope that gives you a rather um, good overview of uh, what uh, deformation looks like, right. That was the whole point of it and I tried to show you deformation, different examples of deformation. Uh, in the first case we uh, saw, okay. in the first case we saw some fluid flow, uh, this, this video and then the, the, the next one we saw deformation of uh, a meniscus. Uh, the fluid flow was difficult to visualize, uh, two different techniques are, are employed and uh, then I showed you uh, some deformation happening in a, in a uh, solid body uh, using photoelastic measurement. This is also a different experimental technique and then uh, here we showed uh, failure using a f uh, an exemplified uh, technique called DIC. So, these are all different videos. and. Uh, this gives you an idea of what uh, type of uh, uh, course material you are going to see in this particular class. Uh, this is just an introductory lecture, so I just want to give you overview of the entire thing and uh, in, in this particular module. And I hope uh, some of you are thinking why do materials deform, I mean at Newton's time uh, he has clearly uh, intended to take a rigid body. and. Uh, uh, after uh, now we clearly see that real bodies do deform. So, what is new? What is uh, uh, why do we understand why bodies deform? Well, there is a reason why bodies deform is goes back to why what actually forms the basis of matter and uh, here uh, I would like to, uh, to involve a historical uh, overview here and we know that matter is now made of atoms right. And, uh, but the, the idea of atoms and molecules has been hypothesized for a very, very long time. And uh, for example, uh, in India there was this famous school of thought called the Nyaya Vaisheshika uh, school of thought. And this school of thought had uh, uh, thought about this particular problem as to the composition of matter and uh, they realized that matter is actually made out of very uh, minuscule uh, 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 building blocks so as to say. So, I am going to quote from a particular book, I am going to give you the reference also and it says, uh, the Nyaya Vaisheshika philosopher has come to the conclusion that all sensible bodies are ultimately composed of extremely minute, invisible and infrasensible particles called Parmanu uh, atoms. Right. And uh, it, this book uh, later on, uh, so I will also tell you which book it is, it is uh, Studies in Nyaya Vaisheshika Metaphysics written by S. Bhaduri, it is a pretty old book 1947 is the publication date and uh, uh, here it says uh, according to him uh, the ultimate unit of matter is not an atom, but a minimal gross body which has been called the truti the molecule of old philosophers. So, uh, the understanding that uh, atoms and molecules make up matter is, is uh, was already uh, there for a very, very long time and the Naya Vaisheshika school is ancient uh, right and it is very, very old and it is interesting that they uh, came up with this. Uh, obviously, as uh, science progressed and technology progressed, uh, we gained better and better understanding of what these atoms actually look like, uh, what uh, are they really indivisible or there is there is more to that. And uh, obviously, in the last uh, 150 years or 200 years, uh, we have taken massive leaps in our understanding of uh, the 
atom itself. And um, I am uh, just going to uh, quickly show you this photograph. This is uh, this is Rutherford uh, pictured, I believe, in 1905. I mean, I've taken this from Wikipedia, but the original source of this is this particular book, uh, uh, The Life and Letters of uh, Lord Rutherford. Um, and his experiments and obviously many of his other, uh, other great scientists, they proved that matter is made out of small indivisible particles called uh, atoms and, uh, and they realize what it is made out of. There is a nucleus, there is an electron rotating around. Now, in matter, uh, atoms and molecules can be arranged in different fashion. For example, uh, you can have a lattice structure and you can have atoms arranged in lattices in a crystal structure. right? So, you can have a lattice structure and you can have your atoms placed at different locations. That is what usually happens in solids. Or you can have matter uh, just uh, uh, atoms bouncing against each other in no particular order and that is what happens to your uh, fluids, uh, liquids and gases. So, deformation of matter is basically a rearrangement of atoms at the molecular scale. To understand deformation, you actually have to understand why that uh, molecule or atom displaced and what is causing it and how they are, um, how they were located in the very beginning and what is their new state. Uh, we are not, in this particular course, we are not going to look at the molecular nature of matter. I mean, or, or rather, uh, we are not trying to understand how the molecules themselves rearrange, but we are going to look at uh, a more macroscopic picture of the same thing. Okay? And uh, the macroscopic picture is going to help us out uh, in understanding uh, uh, the, uh, the overall uh, uh, deformation and the quantification of that itself will be very, very enlightening. So, this is uh, just for our own sake that the matter is made out of atoms and I am not going to go into details, uh, but if somebody wants to later on understand uh, the finer principles behind it, you have to look at the molecular nature. Um, there is one more subtle point that I would like to make uh, before I end this particular module. And uh, that subtle point uh, relates, uh, well, it is best to uh, show you by example, right. So, uh, uh, in my spare time, I like to, uh, to do some astrophotography and uh, this is a photo from my house. Uh, this, is, uh, this is obviously a tree here on the side, uh, but what is interesting is uh, this, these three stars are the Orion's belt stars. And um, uh, in, the, in this very small box, if you are, if you have a very clear night, and if you see the Orion's uh, uh, belt, just a little bit below it, uh, you these are the other stars of the Orion constellation. By the way, um, there is a small uh, hazy region, uh, which is, if you are able to look at it, uh, you'll be able to see that it's composed of these gases. So here. This is expanded view. These are all dots are all the stars. This uh, structure here, these are gases. And this is uh, nothing but the Orion Nebula, which is a vast expanse of gases and gases that are flowing out and flowing out very, very fast. Okay. Um, fast is a relative term and that is the point I would like to make here before uh, we finish off here today's class. And, um, this is a picture I took from last year okay? and I took one more this year and I am going to show you that uh, image. It is a, there is a lot of noise on this side and I am sorry about that, but you can see the structure overall. Uh, there is a satellite trail by the way, these lines, these are uh, a satellite was moving across it. Now, these gases, so these, these all red colors, these are all gases, the dots are stars. Uh, you have a strong element of flow here. Uh, you can actually see bow shocks. I mean, it is difficult with my camera, but if you have a strong enough telescope, uh, Hubble can see it, for example. You can see bow shocks around stars. Uh, you, these gases are flowing out at uh, perhaps thousands of kilometers per second. Uh, an astrophysicist can tell us better the exact velocity. But, uh, you know, I took this photo last year, I took this photo this year, and they look exactly the same. So, you have this deformation, but I cannot see it, right? Uh, why is that? You should think about it. Uh, the answer uh, here is we have to understand uh, 
whatever you want to observe, you have to have the experimental resolution to capture that. And uh, just because there is deformation does not mean you can see it and uh, uh, the resolution can be in time or it can be in space. I am going to show you an example of resolution in time uh, in a second here, uh, but hopefully uh, uh, this uh, tells you that uh, just because there is deformation that does not mean your experimental technique can capture it. Uh, here for me, even though uh, in reality uh, the gases are moving out very, very fast. Uh, to me, this is a static nebula. It is the same that was the last year. It will be the same 10 years on. Uh, the patterns will barely change and uh, yeah, so that is what it is. So, I will show you one more example uh, and I want to read out from this uh, very interesting paper. And this paper's title is uh, the pitch drop experiment. Okay, you can find this paper online uh, if you if you look for it. And uh, this is written by Edgeworth Dalton Parnell, and uh, this paper was written and uh, published in 1984. And it describes uh, a, uh, an experiment that is uh, actually I believe it's still going on in Australia right now. And it describes the experiment right here that in the foyer of the Department of Physics at the University of Queensland in Brisbane it is, is an experiment to illustrate for teaching purposes the fluidity and the very high viscosity of pitch set up in 1927 by Professor Thomas Parnell, the first professor of physics there. So, I am going to not read out the whole thing, but I will just uh, quickly tell you what has been happening. So, this is, uh, wait, I do not think I can use my. Uh, so, if you look at this image on this uh, right hand side, you see a funnel and there is black thing inside it is star and this star uh, and this, uh, this, funnel, this funnel here is cut, right. So, this uh, little drop that has formed right here, this, uh, this star is actually going to flow out and actually going to form in the form of small droplets. But I think all of you have seen tar, you know that tar behaves almost like a solid body in our regular experience, does not it? So, how come it is flowing? Well, if you have to wait really long, I mean if you want to read the paper, it tells you uh, the durations in which it, a single drop fell. So, it tells you the experiment began in 1930, the stem was first cut. In 1938, uh, that is almost uh, 8 years, the first drop fell, 1947 the second drop fell, and 1954. Uh, the third drop and the sixth drop. So, it has been falling in one drop, one drop at a time in about almost a decade, right. One, one drop takes almost a decade for it to fall. Uh, that also tells you that um, the flow or the deformation uh, that you observe is very strongly dependent upon how you see the phenomenon, the, the time resolution and the spatial resolution. So, these are two very important things uh, to keep in mind when setting up experiments in order to resolve uh, properly what you want to see. We uh, will not go into uh, details of how to do that because these are very uh, uh, experimental dependent uh, um, or situation dependent um, things for you to set up. But if you ever do an experiment, you should be very mindful of both these resolutions. And uh, for our course, we will straight up assume that you have set it up the right way you know the time resolution and the spatial resolution required and then we will only discuss how you interpret and how you quantify or how you process the data. Okay. So, uh, I hope this introduction uh, gave you some flavor of what this course is going to be about and uh, how we are going to, um, what type of different uh, uh, phenomena we are going to look at. And, uh, uh, I, I will speak to you more about uh, the mathematical details uh, of the course in the next coming lectures. Okay. Uh, so, thank you very much.